Hello, everyone. Welcome to the St. Louis Art Museum's Art Speaks program. My name is Jessica Kennedy, and I'm the educator for adult learning at the museum. Before we begin, please familiarize yourself with the Q&A section located on your screen. Feel free to enter your questions at any time during the program, and we will choose a few to answer at the end. Also, there's live auto transcription available for this program. Please click the CC icon to activate or deactivate the subtitles. Today's program, Art in Production, is the fourth in a series of talks in conjunction with the exhibition, Art Along the Rivers, a Bicentennial Celebration, which is now on view at the museum. For this installment, we are joined by Amy Torbert, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Assistant Curator of American Art. Thanks for being here today, Amy. Thank you, Jessica, for that introduction, and thank you all for being here, wherever you are uh, tuning in from. So I'm excited to get to share the next section with you for those of you who are returning and for those of you who haven't joined us uh, before in this series of talks connected to Art Along the Rivers. Um, I wanted just to very quickly uh, begin with a quick reminder about the introduction. So as I'm sure many of you already know, uh, Art Along the Rivers has been organized in conjunction with the 200th anniversary of Missouri statehood. And so rather than deciding to study the entire state of Missouri, uh, my co-curator, Melissa Wolf, and I decided to focus on this portion uh, in yellow here, which we call the Confluence region. And so all of the objects in the show were either made or collected in this area. And for a longer description of why and what really important ideas this decision conveys, I encourage you to either visit the show, visit the website, um, or when they are posted, go back and watch the earlier uh, portions of our series of talks. So um, here again is an overview of our exhibition galleries and the exhibition consists of 155 what we hope and believe to be really compelling objects that tell histories of creativity and artistic production in and around the confluence region. Uh, so we've already talked about the introduction, section one, section two, so we're now up to section three. Um, uh, which is our focus today. And as you'll probably remember, um, we've decided to present uh, the works in these sections in thematic groupings rather than uh, connected by, or arranged purely by time period or purely by um, culture, for instance. However, section three, if I can advance, there we go, um, takes maybe a little bit more, like it starts from a place of tighter arrangements. So in the earlier sections, uh, so section one or section five, we're really interested in dialogues between specific um, objects. And certainly those dialogues and those objects connect to larger themes. But in section three, we've arranged the the objects within this grouping, this larger grouping. So it's the largest section of the show um, and maybe kind of the most complicated to move through. There are a lot of walls in this section. And so we put those walls in there in order to split the objects up into these six groups that we've really arranged by media. And we've done this um, in order to trace changes and continuities across a single medium um, for objects produced in this area. So for instance, as we'll see in a sec, you know, how did our regions, artisans, craftspeople, and artists use clay from um, the 11th century or 12th century working at Cahokia up until today? And what, what are the through lines and commonalities that we can trace across those a thousand roughly years of production? Um, and how do things differ and change over time? So um, we are going to get into all six of these uh, subsections, if you will, of section three. Um, unless we wanted to be here for like three hours, I am holding myself back and I'm not going to talk about every single work of art, um, all 46 objects in this section, although it pains me not to do so. So if I don't talk about your favorite thing, please ask about it. I have images of everything that we can talk about. Um, and let me also say kind of the, the largest idea of this section. So we've titled it Art in Production, as you can see, and it 
brings together objects that were created to sell. So the idea of being on sale is, is really the thing that connects these six groupings, um, some of which are really specifically thinking about like a material that comes from the ground, for instance. Um, others of them are thinking about um, the objects that have strong common um, elements, so these regional objects with national reputations. I might have needed to work on that title a little bit. It's not quite as pithy as some of the others. Um, or portraits, so a particular artistic genre, and then how artists in our region have engaged with its traditions throughout time. Um, and so, as I think you could probably uh, guess, or you've already seen the show, and so no, this section includes things that are literally made for sale. So furniture, musical instruments, bricks, weather vanes, coverlets, portraits, and more. But it also considers other works that were made to convince others to buy into an idea, like architectural design drawings, or those that promote their maker's reputations, uh, such as a young woman's decorative needlework. Okay. So with those big principles set up, let's get a little bit more specific. But before I do, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge these three individuals um, who we have sadly lost in the past year, and each of whom made really significant lasting contributions to this section, and definitely more importantly, to the larger Missouri and Illinois arts communities. So they are, from left to right, Larry Giles, who is the founder and director of the National Building Arts Center, about which I'll tell you a lot more um, in a moment. Mark Hausman is in the center, so he was the museum director of the Washington Historical Society in Washington, Missouri, who has provided us a couple of just crucial loans for this section and was just such a joy to meet and learn about the rich history of his particular community through and from. And then Tom Alexander on the right, who was a passionate advocate for African art. We don't have that in this section, um, but along with his wife, Laura Rogers, they were dedicated donors to the St. Louis Art Museum. So I just wanted to um, dedicate this talk to their memories and gratitude for their steadfast support of cultural institutions and their belief in the power of objects to ground a community and tell powerful stories. Okay, so on to Clay. And so it's thanks to Larry Giles and Tom Alexander that two of these objects are in the exhibition. So those are the bricks and then Dan Anderson's uh, sculpture, European Water Tank, which is owned by the St. Louis Art Museum, but was given to us by Tom and Laura. So there's a reason that we begin this section with a focus on clay, because it is the quintessential material of the St. Louis region. The confluence of the three largest rivers in North America endowed the area with some of the richest clay deposits in the United States, and artists throughout the centuries really took advantage of this. And so like these artists working across centuries, um, many Many, I mean, clay, this, these three, four objects are one example of this. Other um, industries in this section also uh, are examples of what I'm about to say, which is that many of these industries followed similar patterns of growth and decline. So they began as small scale enterprises. Um, some of them say in the early 19th century in our area, others much, much earlier than that, like 12th century at the Mississippian metropolis of Cahokia. Um, they then, so businesses that artisans and entrepreneurs built connected to the region's uh, leading or most prominent natural resources. Um, many of them expanded soon after the American Civil War through industrialized production. And then in the 20th century often returned to individual artisanal uses. So I am going to let myself dive deeply into um, these four objects along with one other, and then we'll kind of skate a little bit uh, more shallowly over the rest of the sections. But here is our deep dive into this incredible sculpture, the kneeling female figure hoeing a serpent. Uh, so in the 12th century, sculptors working at Cahokia relied on the region's clay resources. They sought a material called flint clay, which was plentiful across southern Missouri, to sculpt small statuettes that represent deities and heroes. And so somebody who was an actual expert in uh, Mississippian art and culture, like our fantastic, phenomenal senior research assistant, Amy Clark, 
would have just known what flint clay was. When I started doing this research, I was very confused about what flint clay was. And specifically, is it a clay like we think of clay today that you can mold figures um, or shapes into? Is it malleable, essentially? Turns out that no, it is not. So it is related mineralogically to porcelain, kaolin, or surface clay, the clay you'd use to make bricks or terracotta, but it's actually a stone and not at all malleable in terms of squishing and uh, shaping. So instead, this sculptor who made um, this statuette, this figure, would have had to chip away at this piece of flint clay, more like carving marble than working with clay as we would think of it. So only artists working at Cahokia uh, are known to have used this particular material, though their sculptures have been found at excavation sites both close to their place of manufacture and thousands of miles away um, in places like Georgia or Louisiana. And so this particular figure was excavated from a farmstead site a few miles from Cahokia. Um, and the damage to the figure's head, which is a little bit hard to see in this view of it, but if you see it in person, it's very noticeable. She's missing the back of her head. Um, that was actually caused um, or occurred during its excavation in 1979. So scholars have proposed that this figurine, this figure, represents a deity known as the old woman who never dies, who is a symbol of the cycle of life and a variant of a mythological mother of all humans and vegetation. And so this sculpture is believed to have been created in order to be destroyed. That is, it was not intended to be used solely as an object of aesthetic contemplation or a spiritual aid just to be looked at, um, but rather it was intended, uh, scholars believe, to have been used during a ritual or a ceremony in which it was struck in the head with a blunt instrument and intentionally buried in order to demonstrate the cycle of life and death in nature. Okay, uh, so if we move on now and jump, you know, uh, 700 years forward, roughly, um, along with flint clay, a related material, so surface clay or earthenware clay, um, was plentiful in the St. Louis area and ideal for making bricks and terracotta. It had been laid down by glacial ice sheets on the floodplains of rivens, rivers or lake basins, and so therefore our um, uh, American bottoms, as the area right around the Mississippi River, right around St. Louis on both sides is known, was really rich in this material. So by 1900, St. Louis had become the largest brick making city in the world, shipping bricks across the US and overseas. The industry's growth and dominance owed most to the Hydraulic Press Brick Company, which became um, the largest manufacturer both in the city and really in the world. Founded in 1868, the company patented a machine that used hydraulic pressure to produce uniformly sized and densely compacted bricks. As buildings grew taller in the late 19th century, thanks to the introduction of iron and steel, steel skeleton frames, architects and clients embraced uh, walls of finely pressed face brick which were often combined with those in a variety of ornamental patterns, like the ones we see on the left. Um, and really this uh, turn towards brick and away from stone or wood uh, offered a greater variety of designs at a lower price point and with superior fireproofing qualities. So by 1929, uh, the hydraulic press brick companies bricks could be found on hundreds of buildings across the country. And we see some here in a promotional um, image put together by the company itself um, that is demonstrating their reach and scope of buildings. So all of these that you see listed um, below are bricks that include or buildings that include their bricks. And so maybe the most recognizable to us today is the Chrysler building kind of at the top right of that photograph. Uh, Navy Pier in Chicago also is built using hydraulic press bricks. And our own sculpture hall at the St. Louis Art Museum um, includes some or a lot um, too. So as the popularity of bricks grew, so too did the burgeoning industry of architectural terracotta. And the term terracotta, of course, is Latin for burnt 
earth. So it's uh, similar in a lot of ways to bricks, um, but different enough in its possibilities and potentials of being sculpted. Uh, so in 1883, Joseph Winkle, who has just a wonderful name, uh, founded St. Louis's first major firm, which quickly attained widespread recognition for its abilities to translate inventive, expressive designs into the relatively economical material of terracotta. Winkle came from Staffordshire, England, um, and if any of you are fans of the Great Pottery Throwdown on HBO, I know I am. It's essentially the region where the Midlands potteries um, are located, where that show takes place. So Winkle moved to St. Louis with knowledge that he had gained from training in England, and he founded a new company, uh, which was located at the present day intersection of Manchester Road and Hampton Avenue. Um, if you've ever been to the business, the Green Shag Market, it's you're standing on Winkle Terracotta's property. Uh, so Winkle first applied his training to create designs during the 1880s, such as this sunflower panel intended to decorate houses or smaller commercial buildings. But his uh, company really achieved national prominence for this building on the right, which we tried very hard to somehow bring to the exhibition, but didn't quite manage to do so. So this is the Wainwright building which in addition to being recognized as the first successful um, use of a steel frame construction in a building, so a precursor to the true skyscrapers um, that would come a few decades later, um, it really was the first time that terracotta was used in quite such an inventive way um, to decorate the friezes. And I hope you see those at the top of the building and then between the windows in the photograph on the right. So Winkle was not the only terracotta firm out there in like around, you know, between, well, those dates, uh, 1883 and 1955, but they really were one of the most significant nationally. And then um, to bring us up to the present or near present. So while this uh, particular sculpture comes from 1996, Dan Anderson, its sculptor is very much still working today and producing um, fascinating, wonderful objects. So the brick making and architectural terracotta industries uh, here had diminished in the 20th century due to changes in building techniques and styles, but regional artists continue to work with clay. So Anderson is based in uh, Edwardsville, Illinois, and he creates sculptures like European water tank that join artistic expression in clay to the built environment. And I really encourage you to come and look closely at this object. It's typically on view in our galleries, so it's not something that um, we've been hiding in any way, uh, but it definitely deserves close, a very close look at the phenomenal surface that Anderson achieves um, through uh, blackening the vessel um, during its firing and then sandblasting it to bring out these really, really um, mesmerizing colors on its surface. Okay, as you can see, I could talk just forever about objects. So I'm gonna try to pick up the pace a little bit with metal. Uh, so clay might be, clay and bricks especially, might be the material that's really associated with St. Louis um, and our region uh, more broadly. But arguably um, metal, so specifically iron, um, really mm, could be argued had a greater development, um, greater impact on the development of the state of Missouri and its economy. So the South East Missouri Lead District contains the world's highest concentration of galena, the natural mineral form of lead, as well as significant quality or quantities of iron. And so proximity to these large iron ore deposits, coupled with St. Louis's transportation networks, supported a local boom in the industry in the 19th century. And so businesses that produced cast iron objects, such as this bench and stove, just flourished. And so I could go into great detail about either one of these, but instead I'm going to use this opportunity to ask a or to raise a question that I think this whole section might ask for some of you or maybe all of you, which is, can a functional object be considered a work of art? And so you're not going to be surprised to hear me say yes, like emphatically yes. Um, and so I'm going to try to explain why we feel that way using this stove. 
So a central theme of this exhibition is to celebrate creativity in design. Every single object in the show began with an idea, how to solve a problem and make a better product, how to create an entirely new and innovative form with existing materials, and how to bring more beauty into the world, and so much more. And so this parlor stove is a really excellent example of this process. Its manufacturer, whose factory you see here, uh, the St. Louis-based Excelsior Stove Works, had become the largest stove manufacturer in the country thanks to its innovative designs. So it took creativity and ingenuity both to develop more efficient methods for simultaneously heating a parlor and cooking food, as this stove does. So the top of it heats, uh, cooks food, and the bottom heats a parlor. I'm hoping I'm getting that right, um, one or the other. Um, and, and then um, also it took creativity and ingenuity to develop the, and uh, to design the floral embellishments that decorate all parts of this stove's exterior. And it was really meant to be a decorative object because it was intended for a parlor. Um, and thank you for the person who asked the question about where Excelsior was located. So it was located on the St. Louis Riverfront, um, just a little bit north of where the arch stands today. And I mean, I hope that this uh, image from 1888 really demonstrates the, the, the scale of this enterprise. When we say that it was the largest stove manufacturer in the country um, during this mid 19th century period, this is what we mean. It was a really dominant industry in St. Louis. Um, so we can move from this. So something that I hope I might have convinced you should be seen in the same way um, as, uh, you know, we should ask the same questions of this object in terms of the design that it took to produce it as we ask of an oil painting. Um, and they tell us different things, certainly, um, but there's no reason to ask them significantly different questions or to value one more than the other. Um, but I also wanted to share with you a sculpture that is purely aesthetic. Um, and so let me begin by saying that even though this uh, sculpture has the title weather vane, it, that is not intended to describe its function, um, which is something that we have realized that we did not lay out very clearly in the label. So this was never intended to be to function as a weather vane on top of a structure, for instance. Instead, its form is um, supposed to, uh, the artist is responding in its form to the form of weather vanes. So in the mid 1960s, um, this sculptor, L. Brent Kington, instigated the international revival of blacksmithing as an artistic medium. And so he had moved to the area, um, the Confluence region, to join the faculty of SIU Carbondale. Once he arrived, he became inspired by the area's abundance of forged iron and steel and the techniques that were in danger of being lost as older practitioners in those medium, media, uh, so blacksmiths, were retiring. And so he, he started to produce a series of sculptures using those older techniques and a medium, uh, so forged and welded steel, that was seen as not artistic. Um, but he, I think, demonstrates that it absolutely is and can be. So this sculpture um, introduces a series of contradictions at the heart of his practice. And so what we're looking at here is a sculpture that has two parts. So there's the long kind of horizontal arm with that curl at the left. That's one part. And that is balanced as delicately as one can imagine um, on top of the vertical base, um, which then, or the vertical kind of line, which then has another horizontal base. Um, so that curl that wraps down is the second part. And so he, so despite the seeming unequal balance of that horizontal element, that it looks like the weight is at the left, I mean, the weight is at the left, and that it gets kind of light and delicate and airy as it goes along to the right, um, the sculpture remains in perfect balance. And so um, Kington even wrote about watching this uh, sculpture during a windstorm, and he described it twirling and dancing and um, that top portion just like wiggling all over the place, um, but never falling off, so continuing to ma maintain this perfect balance. And so he's really interested um, in these contradictions of 
hard soft right how can this very tough steel be made to look like it can you know uh, wave in a way um and and then he really is interested in thinking about the historic role of the blacksmith. Um, Kington says, the blacksmith is the giver of culture. He is the innovator. And so Kington himself is recognized now um, as being a practitioner who one could say the same thing about. So moving on to our next grouping. Um, so immigrants to the confluence region drew from their homeland traditions to build industries that gained national prominence. So from zithers to rifles to stained glass, the businesses represented on this screen shape the identities of their local communities. And I'd be happy to go into that more um, in Q&A. Uh, but instead, I'm going to draw our attention to the fourth set of objects in this grouping, um, which are these corn cob pipes. And so, and so they are the ones at the left. The image at the right is just, a, it's not in the exhibition, just meant for illustration only. And so perhaps I can hear you asking a similar question as to the stove, right? So how are these works of art, these objects on the left? At least the stove had flowers on it. I mean, it was somewhat decorative. And so I'd respond again that yes, these deserve to be displayed and studied in the context of an art museum, just as much as any other type of visual or material culture. And so they merit this attention because of how their first designer, um, a man named Henry Tibby, used local materials at hand to innovate and create an entirely new type of object. So Tibby was a Dutch immigrant who combined his old and new countries um, by using local Missouri corn to make pipes in a European pipe tradition. And so that's that image on the right is showing um, a traditional Dutch Meerschaum pipe um, named for the material that it was made from. So uh, Tibby then used his wood turning skills to um, harden the corn cobs by covering them with plaster and then turning them on a lathe. And he patented this process um, of hardening and fireproofing the cob. So um, the and so what we're seeing here on the left are pipes from that follow the um, original design. So that's the one at the top right, um, but that have slightly different histories themselves. So the company that Tibby founded, the Missouri Meerschaum Company, um, has continued to this day. You can go to Washington, Missouri, the corn cob capital of the world, and, um, uh, and purchase um, really any pipes in any one of these three designs still. And, um, but from this early moment in the late, mid to late 19th century, the pipe's popularity continued to increase um, with endorsements from a litany of real and fictional figures, including Mark Twain, Rudyard Kipling, Presidents Hoover and Eisenhower, and even Frosty the Snowman and Popeye the Sailor. Um, but the most famous devotee of the corn cob pipe was absolutely General Douglas MacArthur, who even designed a pipe on his own that he got the Missouri Meerschaum Company to um, produce. And so it's the largest one at the um, bottom center here. So moving on from that particular deep dive into a local industry, um, we then turn to portraiture. And so we look at portraiture as an industry in order to ask who sat for their portraits, particularly during the 19th century, how did they wish to be portrayed, and how did the resulting portraits communicate their sitters' ambitions? And so these three portraits um, are among the earliest in the exhibition, um, but they range from very private, so that miniature on the upper left, um, which is um, about four inches around, so very suited to private life at an early date, into the very public, so portraits of Daniel Boone, who might be one of the first celebrities to come from this area. And so we see two portraits here. I'm not going to go into how they're related, but they are. I'd be happy to um, in the Q&A, um, but they really are public portraiture coming to an area that in the 1820s was still seen as the frontier. Um, we also look at painter, painters both with and without academic training. 
And so we really hope that viewers, you, might compare these two portraits um, to think about how portraitists with different backgrounds are able to capture quintessential elements of their sitters' personalities. So the portrait on the right is made by Manuel de Franca, who was St. Louis's most popular portraitist in the mid 19th century. He was born in Portugal, uh, trained at the Academy um, in Lisbon, moved to Philadelphia first, um, where he continued his training at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and exhibited there, and then moved to St. Louis, um, where he spent the rest of his career from the early 1840s through uh, 1865. Um, and so he really became one of St. Louis, I mean, St. Louis's most popular portraitists during that period because of this, his ability to capture a romantic sensibility. So those clouds swirling in the background, the tense horse, um, he really creates drama. The portraitist on the left, we actually still don't know his or her identity. Um, we feel confident that research will reveal it at some point. But for right now, we are calling him or her just simply the Potosi painter. So um, this portrait came to the museum as a gift uh, from the Cresswell family, who had who's the family, multiple generations, had owned it since its creation. So we're looking at uh, Hannah and Joseph Cresswell, who lived in Potosi in the early 1840s. Um, this portrait just passed, it was an, uh, we're sure it was an itinerant artist who passed through the area, painted many families' portraits. Um, uh, and we've been able to find a number of others, partially because, and We've been able to attribute them to the same artist, partially because of that large hand. Many of them, most of them, include a hand like that. So literally, the hand of the Potosi painter. Um, but even though we still don't know a lot about the artist um, of this portrait on the left, we um, we think that they should be celebrated for their ability to endow their sitters, like the Cresswells here, with no less individuality than seen in de Franca's portrait. So you get the sense that you really are interacting with two specific people who have their own personalities and stories and histories in really all three of these, um, or in both of these portraits, all three of these people. So um, the invention of photography during the same decade, though, changed expectations um, for an access to portraiture as this new technology was able to produce images faster and for less money. So hundreds of St. Louis residents and visitors to the city sat for Thomas Easterly, whose daguerreotypes um, seen here uh, offer a more inclusive collective portrait of St. Louis in the mid 19th century. So daguerreotypes are just simply the term given to this particular type of early photography. So um, I just wanted to point out a couple neat facts um, about this group of four, which is generously on loan for the Missouri Historical Society. So one is that um, the portrait of Keokuk um, at the, in the middle here um, uh, is considered to be the first uh, photographic portrait of a Native American. So it was taken when uh, Keokuk, who was a leader in the Sauk and Fox Nation, uh, visited St. Louis in 1847. Um, the dramatic portrait um, of the man to his right of Thomas Forsythe, um, I wanted to mention only because it is inscribed, somebody, we think Easterly, fairly confidently, um, inscribed, really wrote into the photographic um, plate, um, that title that is given here. So Thomas Forsythe, Mountain Spy and Guide. And so we've got a lot of questions about, ooh, spy? So Forsythe was hun one of hundreds of mountain men um, who uh, went west to the Rocky Mountains as a fur trader, as a trapper, as a guide. And so maybe in a similar way to, um, Alfred Kennedy here, who was a doctor, um, uh, both of these really capture kind of a romantic sensibility um, that was popular at this mid um, uh, 19th century moment. And then maybe most significantly, Easterly photographed the area's African-American residents, such as the barber Robert J. Wilkinson, who we see on the left. 
And so many of them might have agreed with American abolitionist Frederick Douglass that the quote, democratic art of photography allowed African Americans to appear as individuals rather than as reductive stereotypes. And so in an 1861 lecture titled Pictures and Progress, Frederick Douglass wrote, quote, all, sorry, quote, men of all conditions and classes can now see themselves as others see them and as they will be seen by those who shall come after them, thanks to photography. So to wrap up our portraiture section and eventually this whole section, um, I wanted to share again, I think every single object in the show is one of my favorites, but definitely one of my favorites. Um, uh, this portrait by the contemporary artist, Casey Zavalia, who lives and works in St. Louis. Um, and so her portraits as a whole really bridge the, the um, sections, the subsections in this grouping. So between portraiture and the textile arts. And as a whole, they really challenge the longstanding perception that needlework is less of a fine art than painting. So what are we looking at here? So if you are savvy and quick at reading um, my captions, you can see that this is embroidery, this, well, both embroidery and acrylic. Um, but this detail certainly makes that more clear. Um, so Zavalia is trained as a painter, and she practices what she describes as renegade embroidery by attempting to replicate brush strokes with stitches. And I mean, in person, and even in this detail, her, uh, abilities are just striking, right? How she manages to capture the textures of skin, of hair, of clothing, all through the medium of um, needle and thread. And so that is one important element of this portrait, right? This challenge that the idea of a purely oil paint is somehow more significant or more of a fine art than needlework is. Another really important aspect of Zavalia's work is her encouragement to us, there we go, to consider not just, well, she really asks us to consider which side of the portrait, the front, which we see on the left, or the back, which we see on the right, we should value. And so on the back side, what we're seeing here is a second typically unseen image, an uncanny double formed by the embroidery process. So for those of you who um, have practiced needlework in any form yourself, right, you know that as you stitch one side, it creates an image, um, a mirror image on the back side. And certainly the, the traditions of embroidery uh, the conventions say that the backside should be very, very neat. Um, there shouldn't be any straight threads, any straight knots. As I hope you might be able to see, Casey doesn't necessarily put that much stock in those conventions. Um, and so instead, um, she is really interested um, in this other side. And so she says, this is a bit of a quote from her. So quote, the beauty and the knots and the mess of this other side um, made her really start to think, quote, about the parallels of this other side that we all have um, to the side that we uh, show to the world. So she says, we only want to show the front side, especially in this social media age. And this other side, this back side, is one that we all possess. It is knotty, knotted, and it's messy. And it has so much potential for beauty and something that everyone can relate to. So just to give us a glance by way of wrapping up at other works um, in our um, textile section. So it includes these three um, of artists who marketed themselves through their skills with thread, fiber, and fabric. Um, and so men typically were weavers in the mid 19th century, such as John Eusebius Snyder, who was born in Germany, but made coverlets like this one um, in St. Charles County at his home on the farm where he lived and worked. Uh, on the left here is a sampler made by Susan Bushy when she was 11 years old. She is the youngest artist in the exhibition. Kind of wonderfully, our oldest artist, or the 
age at which an artist was oldest when they made a work of art in the exhibition, um, is also a um, fabric artist. So in the next show, come back next week to hear Melissa's talk on our fourth section, and you'll be able to reference uh, works by Charlie Logan, who was age 70 when he made his suit of clothes. Um, so Susan Bushy uh, making the sampler to demonstrate both her skills um, at embroidery, but then also her um, attributes as a person. So attributes like patience, uh, creativity, uh, industriousness, uh, skills that were seen as good indicators of whether young women would become good at what they were training to do, which was to manage a household. Um, and then we love comparing uh, Susan Bushy's work to the wall hanging, the woven wall hanging on the right, which is made by uh, Lillian Blazer. And it really um, celebrates a moment in the early 20th century in which textile creation and design were starting to be considered as a fine art. So Glazer taught um, weaving and textile manufacture at um, the School of Fine Arts at Washington University. And she encouraged bold experimentation um, with her students who as a group established the Weavers Guild of St. Louis in 1926. And the guild continues today as the second oldest group of its kind in the United States. One more work of textile um, art is this really dramatic quilt made by Anna Jane Parker, who was a professional seamstress and dressmaker in St. Louis. Uh, she had moved to St. Louis um, shortly after she was emancipated, so she had been born into slavery in North Carolina. When she came to St. Louis, where she spent the rest of her life, um, she started working um, in the textile uh, industry, um, but really for herself, not um, just kind of working one on one as a dressmaker with clients. And this quilt that she made, though, was not made on commission. And it actually probably is not was not even used, which perhaps explains its wonderful condition. So it was made with scraps um, that were around from her business of making dresses out of fine silks. Um, I should be saying my colleagues who study this, uh, objects like this would be correcting me in saying that this is actually a quilt top, not a quilt, because it does not have a back on it. Um, and so it descended in her family who um, eventually uh, passed along to Colonial Williamsburg. Okay, so we have made it, sorry, I'm going a little long, um, but we've made it to our last section, which will be relatively tight. And so this section looks at design drawings. And so really every object included in the exhibition starts with the spark of an idea and nothing demonstrates that's better than the drawings in this section. And so I love starting with this one, which is an idea that was never fulfilled. So we're talking about the draw, well, actually both drawings, but the drawing on the left, um, that kind of bird's eye view is the one that is in the exhibition. Um, the drawing across the top is in our collection. It could have been in the exhibition if we had a lot of room, extra space, um, but it is here just as an illustration. And so what we're looking at um, are two drawings that come from the same moment, the same project. So we're looking at a proposed expansion to the St. Louis Art Museum. Um, so Cass Gilbert had designed our building, the building that still stands right over there, um, in 1904 for the St. Louis World's Fair. In 1916, our board of trustees commissioned Gilbert and his studio to produce um, a series, an additional series of drawings that would lay out how the museum could be expanded. And so it is a substantial expansion um, if you can picture this in your mind. So that red uh, square represents our current building. So the actual footprint expansion is like 10 times the size of our current uh, Cass Gilbert building. The image on the right, I hope you can see um, the dome that Gilbert has proposed putting over the entire building, which rises above the roof line of our current building. It's just huge and so ambitious. And he uh, really was equally interested in uh, redesigning or modifying slightly the landscape of Forest Park to reclaim some of the grandeur of the World's Fair, even just 
12 years after it had happened. And so down at the lower left of the drawing on the left, um, it's hard to see in this, but is the um, building that is now the Missouri History Museum. So just to orient you. So certainly the lagoon and maybe even kind of Art Hill, that amphitheater, look not dissimilar to how they are right now. But the plans themselves for the expansion um, were obviously shelved for quite a while. I mean, or ever, <laughs> but they're sitting here. Should we ever want to, you know, use them <laughs> for inspiration um, for future expansions? Who knows? Not my call to make. Um, I include these two images here just simply to say that there are other drawings in this section that I'm not able to show you on this talk um, because of copyright limitations, but they are drawings that connect to the um, arch and then the Eads Bridge. And so this book that I'm showing you here, showing the Eads Bridge in the St. Louis waterfront is in this section. And it is just such a very cool, here is the detail, um, portrait of every single building in St. Louis, in the, the city limits of St. Louis in 1876. So it's called Pictorial St. Louis. It is a massive undertaking and just a gold mine for research um, and really preserving um, the architectural ideas and history of the city, much of which does not remain today. Some of it does, but certainly like the waterfront, the levee here, this is roughly where the arch is much, much different. Um, but other drawings um, uh, connect and reveal the collaborations between architects, engineers, and contractors. And a great example of this um, is this drawing, uh, which um, lays out the V-shaped elements uh, that make up the spaces between the arches at Priory Chapel, which was designed by Gio Obata. Um, in the um, late 1950s, early 1960s. And so although this drawing and the one for the arch, for instance, um, were both meant as tools to be used in larger projects, here in this exhibition, they really are valued for their aesthetic qualities as much. And the last object we will talk about um, is this drawing, which I realize is really hard to see on the screen. Um, and so what we are looking at here, and so I'm going to show you details that make it clearer. So we started, I started this talk by talking about architectural terracotta. And so this drawing is the answer to the question, okay, you have all these pieces of terracotta for a facade of a building, how do they go up there? So it is effectively either, you could think of it as a jigsaw puzzle maybe, or a friend of mine recently compared it to like the diagrams you get with Lego building sets that show you exactly how to put together the pieces. Um, so, whoops. Uh, so it is one of those for this building on the left, the Ambassador Theater, um, which was built in 1925 around that date in downtown St. Louis. And so let me go in closer, both to the building itself and the plan, so that you can really see just the incredible detail and care that's been taken um, to lay out this entire facade. So what we're seeing on the left and in the center, so the left is a photograph of one of these decorative arch treatments um, above and around windows on this building. The detail from the plan, from the drawing in the center corresponds exactly to that piece. And then there's an even bigger detail on the right, just so you can see it a little bit better on your screen. So the building itself was demolished in 1996. Um, so we can't go to visit it, but the building. But someday, kind of, you might be able to go and visit this facade in various ways. And so that is thanks entirely to this incredible institution, organization, place called the National Building Arts Center. So Larry Giles, who I had mentioned at the start, was the founder and really visionary behind um, this place. He ran for a number of years an architectural salvage company. I'm not sure that's exactly the right way to describe it, but he was involved in um, pulling down buildings in downtown St. Louis as the architectural fabric was changing. But instead of just throwing away that material, he saved it 
all or nearly all and founded over time um, this institution, which is located in Sarge, Illinois. Um, and so I love this picture because you both see the buildings of the National Building Arts Center in the foreground, but then the arch and the St. Louis skyline in the background. So it's very close to us. It's like a 20 minute drive from the art museum. Um, so the National Building Arts Center is a nonprofit. It's a collecting institution. Um, it has just phenomenal collections, um, some of which are on display, others of which not exactly. Um, but it is going to be open for tours um, in the coming weeks and months. So I very much encourage you to uh, visit their website um, and, and then see if it interests you as a place. It is just we all should be, we are so fortunate to have St. Louis's built environment and the history that we're able to learn through these objects saved at a place like this. Um, and it is well worth a visit. So with that, with apologies for going on for so very long, um, I'm gonna wrap up and open it up for questions. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Um, uh, we do have a few questions. If anyone else has any more, I encourage you to type them in. But I actually have a question before we go to those. So going back to that Mississippian figure um, that we talked about, that you talked about early on. So you mentioned that the head was actually broken during the ex excavation, but that often the heads were broken during ceremonies. Is that right? Yes, okay. yes. And I okay. realize that that is confusing. Um, so the parts of this figure and others like it um, that seem to have been broken during ceremonies, they seem to have been somehow placed back together. So there are ah. breaks that seem older and breaks that seem more recent. Um, and so it is a really, really good question. I apologize that that I think is all I feel confident saying about it. And I apologize to my colleagues out there if I've gotten that completely wrong in various ways. Um, it's funny to be working on a project that involves things so far from one's own expertise. <laughs> it's just a really, really good learning experience, right? It really, really is. <laughs> um, okay, great. So we have a couple, we have a few questions. I don't think we're gonna be able to get to all of them, but um, let's see. Someone has asked, um, and this is kind of a technical question, so you may, you know, again, this might be outside of your wheelhouse, but um, what is the composition of steel making that makes it different from iron? I am so sorry. This is a question that I should know the answer to, and I did when I was deep in writing the catalog essay, that it steel has other elements added to it. Okay. Um, and I feel like this. I am so sorry. I am not going to, let's all Google this. Somebody yeah. add it to the question. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> it's no, a no. really, really good question. I apologize for, so, st so steel equals something plus iron. <laughs> Got it. Whereas Got it. iron is iron. <laughs> Got it. No worries. You can't know everything. Um, just sorry. One just... can hope. No, no, <laughs> it's good. Um, so, I mean, to like spin this in a nice way, right? Like this show relied on so many other people's expertise. Um, and it, it feels like they all should be here. Um, there was a time when we were thinking about programming for this show. Um, <sighs> Right, when we thought that we might be able to do in-person programs. Yeah. So Melissa, my co-curator and I really wanted, so we now have this series of us telling you about the show, which we love to do. This is so great. What we really envisioned this being was asking experts to come and talk about their objects. Um, and it just would have been too difficult to do it virtually. So it's good that we're doing this, but I'm sorry that you're missing out on super, super good knowledge from experts. That, that is okay. And actually that just makes people, if you want, come to the exhibition if you haven't, but also there is a catalog available um, mm -hmm. in the museum store. So there's likely lots more information in there as well. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so I'm going to, this is going to be um, our, oh here, someone has answered, iron. <laughs> iron is an, is an element, like on the periodic table of elements. Steel is an alloy comprised of both iron and carbon and has increased strength. So you were, oh. you were there, you just didn't have carbon. <laughs> Tom, thank you for coming to my <laughs> rescue. <laughs> um, someone has asked um, to asked about the zithers. Can you tell us a little bit more about the zither? 
<laughs> oh my gosh. Yes, I can absolutely tell you more about the scissors. Do I have images of scissors? You had I one image, don't. yeah. No, oh. Uh, there we go. Ha! Ah, zither. Um, so I finding the zither. So when we went to Washington, Missouri, um, which is just about an hour and a half west of here, or something like that, um, a really lovely place with lovely people. We kind of knew about corn cob pipes, right? Like that was the thing we had done research about. We, but when we walked into the Washington Historical Society, um, who is the owner and lender of this zither in the exhibition, when we walked in, they have a phenomenal um, display that shows the history of zither making um, in Washington, Missouri, through um, and thanks to this um, Austrian immigrant, Franz Schwarzer who had trained um, as a furniture maker and then a music instrument, musical instrument maker um, in his native Austria, but moved, immigrated um, to the United States and settled eventually in Washington and started this factory um, where that began producing the some of the most highly sought after and high and like uh, most admired forms of zithers in the mid 19th century. Um, and so he uh, submitted them to international competitions for zither makers and won, if not the grand prize, he won like silver medal um, in an early 1870s um, exposition for zither makers. Um, and he shipped his zithers all over the world, both to um, Europe, but also to South America. And they were really um, prized for the quality of their surface decorations. So like this cartouche that I'm showing you a detail of. So this particular zither, as you could have guessed, maybe from seeing that um, marking that says Centennial 1876, was made for the Philadelphia Centennial, a World's Fair and exhibited there. And we just love the um, design of that cartouche. So I should also mention um, a just critical player in this whole exhibition has been Beth Rubin, who is the American Art Department's research assistant. And so, I mean, so many of the things Beth would have known the difference between iron and steel. Um, but um, she was the one who was looking at this and said, huh, that is both an S for Schwarzer and the form of a zither. So great. <laughs> oh, I know. Wow. Right? wow. <laughs> yes. That's fabulous. Um, and if you come to the exhibition, if you are able and stand in, in front of the zither case, you will hear zither music. Um, we very much wanted to uh, include zither music. And so what we really wanted to do was include recordings that were made on zithers owned by the Washington Historical Society, which is a thing that exists. They, they have groups there um, that really keep these traditions alive with these instruments. We weren't able just because of time and resources and to actually get those recordings, but the pieces of music that you're hearing have been suggested to us by folks from the Zither Society in Washington, Missouri. Fabulous, that's fantastic. Well, Thank you so much, Amy. Um, we really appreciate it. This has been wonderful. And don't worry, there's so much more that you can learn. Um, <laughs> if you come to the exhibition, there's so much more. Um, so, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. Um, each of these programs in this series will take place on the next two Thursdays. So next week, uh, Melissa Wolf, the other uh, co-curator will be speaking about the art community section um, of the exhibition. So please join us for that. Um, and I encourage you to register for that program and more at slam.org slash events. And thank you so much, Amy, and have a great day. Thanks all.